I'd saved up enough money to not make a dollar for the first three years. That was critical. Mm -hmm. And lifestyle was going to need to change, obviously going from a great paying job with a lot of stability to uh, making the reckless decision of going out on my own. Mm -hmm. And and so that, that nest egg was critical and I didn't really have a pipeline or anything like that built up. I didn't think that was fair to my employer who was paying me well to give them everything that I had. And so I was comfortable with the idea of going out pretty naked as far as the pipeline goes. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig, and with me, as always, is John Cohen. How are we doing, bud? Uh, we're good. Um, I really got not much. We, uh, we are on a roll. Hopefully get some new guests coming up here shortly. Uh, we got an awesome guest today. And uh, other than that, you know, just hanging in there, you know, another day, another dollar. Yeah, I hear you. Let's just jump into it. Nothing really going on. We've done a few of these today. So if you've heard the last couple ones, you know what's going on. But really excited for today's guest, really excited to uh, learn more about him, hear his story and and have a really great conversation. So with that being said, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. So kick us off, tell everybody a little bit about you, your background, your journey, all that great stuff. Sure. So I can give you the abbreviated or the long version, whatever, whatever tickles your fancy. Whichever you think is going to help everybody listening the most, you go mm-hmm. that way. Okay. So uh, loaded question. So I'll give you an even more loaded answer. And this is, uh, so my name is Aaron Zucker, as you mentioned, I am based in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have a company called Zucker Investment Group, which, uh, you know, my friends and I call it Zig, if you will, <laughs> since I couldn't come up with anything more creative. And we buy unanchored value add retail properties across the Eastern half of the country. I started the business in late 2018. So it's been about two and a half years now. We've bought, by the end of this month, it'll be 14 properties in 10 states, totaling around 18 million bucks or so, 17, 18 million bucks in transactions Mm -hmm. to date. And we have a ton of fun doing it. It's myself and a a couple other acquisitions guys here in-house. And then we have, we run a syndication model. So a lot of just friends and family passing the hat on capital stacks out on the equity. And we have amazing relationships with our vendors, whether it be lenders or tenants, et cetera. So really couldn't be any more proud of what we're building so far here. And then additionally, uh, alongside the the Zig business, uh, I am a franchisee of an urgent care brand called American Family Care. AFC has, I think, 250 locations now across the country, really. Uh, My partner, who's uh, amazing, his name's also Aaron, Aaron Fields, um, was based in Raleigh, and we're we're growing out that business in the Raleigh MSA. So we just bought the rights to do six more clinics in addition to the one that we have open over the next five years. So we're looking to grow uh, that company and having a great time doing it. It's been really fun to, to help a lot of people in that community. It's been a little bit interesting to be on the on the tenant side again. I mean, we we purchased our sites, but eventually, but you know, and, and we we occasionally will sell some of them back. So in, in, in one way, shape, or form, we look at it certainly like a retailer or a med tailor in this instance would. Uh, prior to going out on my own, I was uh, I had an uninterest an, an un what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, unconventional, unconventional, if I could talk today, that'd be pretty helpful for your podcast. An unconventional entry into the business. So uh, in college, I didn't know what commercial real estate was. I just was got together with some friends and did what guys do and talked about owning a bar. And three buddies and, of, and myself ended up scraping together a few shekels, begging, borrowing, stealing the money, however we could get it and getting including inclusive of getting seller financing. And we bought uh, an ex- a failing bar down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I went to school at the University of Alabama. If you can't tell by the thing behind me, roll the tide. <laughs> uh, so did that and we had no idea what we were doing. About 30 or 45 days in, I was walking our rent check down to our landlord's office and it was like a Thursday afternoon, like middle of the day. You would think any any basic company would be open for business. And 
was closed. And I was, I went back and I said, Hey guys, like I had to slide the check under the door. Like, what's the deal here? My, and some of our employees were like, Oh yeah, that guy, he, he's never in, he's always on the golf course. I'm like, how does that work? And he got, they go, well, he owns like 400 buildings like this and people pay him rent. And I was like, I think this bar business thing is pretty cool. I'm excited. It's fun. I'm having drinks with my friends. Like not so bad, but I still think I, I might be more interested in becoming the uh, landlord one day. So fast forward, I was doing an internship in Atlanta one summer and got mixed up with a family friend who was about five or six years older than me. And he lived in this beautiful condo in Buckhead, which is like one of the hot spots of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And it was in this high rise building, four ceiling windows. And one day I built up the courage, you know, my second or third day living there. I was like, Hey man, what do you do? Like, basically being like, how the hell do you have all this money that you can afford this condo? And he was like, well, you know, it's, I, I you see these shopping centers around here as he, as he points out of his window from mm -hmm. his condo, these beautiful shopping centers. I'm like, yeah, what about it? And he goes, well, when they have vacancies, my company owns similar shopping centers. And when they have vacancies, it's my job to put tenants into them. It's called leasing. If, you know, I'm not, I know you don't necessarily know what you want to do for the rest of your life, but I think you'd be pretty good at it. So I go back to Tuscaloosa, I'm still owning and operating the bar with my friends finish up school and eventually moved to Atlanta. And he was kind enough to make some warm introductions for me, whatever. And I uh, eventually ended up starting with DLC management uh, who's based out of New York in their Atlanta satellite office doing leasing of value add retail shopping centers in like 2012. So from there I had an opportunity to move to Charlotte, had a job with Phillips Edison uh, and was sort of a, you know, an opportunity to do, had some success there, I got pretty lucky. Uh, and did some box deals in, in tougher markets where it was difficult to procure tenants. And so that story sort of added up to where I was able to sucker in a uh, really strong family office called Peb Enterprises down in Boca Raton, Florida, uh, to bring me on to run their leasing platform in 2016. They owned about a couple million square feet of mostly retail space across the east, across, I think it was 12 states across the eastern half of the country. And, uh, that was a real opportunity for me to become a small fish in a, or excuse me, a big fish in a small pond, as opposed to a small fish in a big pond, which I'd been private, private, yeah, private previously with Phillips Edison and DLC. And so they not only afforded me an opportunity to make more money, but I was in a leadership role there and also had exposure to what it's like being a real estate operator as opposed to just a leasing robot, if you will. Which was, which is, I'm forever grateful to the Wiener family for taking that flyer on me, especially at that point in time, I was only 27 when they hired me. So like, they didn't have to do that. And uh, not sure why they did it to this day, but it really worked out well for, for, I think for both sides. So we had a good run there and they allowed me to be in the room when they were making pretty critical decisions with respect to hiring and firing people or refinancing or whether they should buy a property or sell it or how to structure leases as, as, it's certainly my expertise or lack thereof in that room and, mm -hmm. and really had the time, time of my life. Uh, we been, unfortunately, we got to a point where, you know, I, I'd expressed a strong interest in wanting to own properties as, as I did before even getting there with them. And they conveyed in a very polite, understandable way that, listen, we've been a family office for 40 years, basically insinuating that they, they're going to be fine without me, which is totally valid and 100% true. Mm -hmm. And so we, I just felt like I was at that inflection point in my career where I knew enough to be dangerous uh, based on an incredible education from them and uh, but still overly ambitious enough to and, and risk adverse enough to want to go out on my own. And so mm -hmm. uh, started the company in December of 2018 and circling back to the, the story of where we're at. So I love it. I guess that's the long version. So I, I hope hopefully you're not regretting me asking me that question, but. That's my story. No, I, I love it because I, I want to ask you more about the, the you know, going from just the leasing to working for a family office because, you know, I think one thing everybody to keep in mind, every family office is very different. I know we had someone um, from a family office that we know on and he said, if you've met one family office, you've met one family office, meaning every single one is slightly different. So it's kind of a, you know, not the best term for him. But I got to imagine the viewpoint that they took on, you know, retail properties and real estate in general had to be very different than the viewpoint that you had with the companies you were just leasing stuff for, right? 
Oh, that's a great point. Completely different approach. Mm -hmm. What were, what were some of those things? Like, what were the things that stuck out to you as like either, you know, you got there and it was kind of like totally changed your mindset or they explained things to you that just made a lot more sense when you viewed it or were just very different than what more traditional investors kind of look at things. Sure. So I think the biggest contrast for me from going from like a company like Phillips Edison, which was, which is still is, I believe the largest privately held grocery REIT in the country, grocery mm -hmm. and shopping center REIT in the country, where, you know, the role was different in the sense that I was a leasing guy, leasing guy only, stay in your lane, become hyper-focused on what you do uh, and contribute to the team accordingly. Whereas at HEB, we were thinking critically about different things. Certain assets needed more attention than others at that particular point in time because there might have been, you know, there might have been a refi that we were trying to get done, or we felt like it was something that was relatively liquid. I used relatively with air quotes because nothing's really liquid in our business. It takes time to sell stuff, but uh, where there might be an opportunity to take advantage of a 1031 or whatever it may be. So there was, there was, uh, there were certain things that became more higher priority than others. Whereas at a larger company where it's, you know, there's a, more of an OPM model and other people's money model, uh, like like the non-trader REIT was set up at Phillips Edison, it's just lease space, lease space, lease space, and do whatever you can to get there. Uh, the they were more core long-term holders. They built their they built their reputation and their balance sheet by being deep value add guys. I caught the tail end of that time, and they were sort of shifting into their non-traded REIT business where it was more core uh, before going to PEB. Whereas PEB is basically in the same business. I I should say it this way. Zig is in the same business as Peb is, is we're just missing a zero. So if they're doing a $30 million deal, we're doing a $3 million deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're, we're actively looking for deals where the NOI can be increased. It might be zero today. I mean, we're buying vacant restaurants on spec. We're buying, you know, or, or very, uh, you know, maybe 67, you know, we're looking at a deal right now where it's 67% leased with, with, uh, with an eight cap on employees. Whereas, it, you know, if it didn't have a grocery anchor component and it wasn't pretty stabilized and it wasn't the number one or number two side in the market, Phillips Edison wasn't looking to acquire it when I was there. Mm -hmm. Period. End of story. So just totally different business models, the way financing was structured, the way the team was structured, the way uh, deals were looked at. And if the back of the napkin analysis at a family office or at that particular family office, to, to make point to you, Chris, uh, would evaluate it, you know, very quickly and make a quick decision. Whereas, at Phillips Edison, it was all about, does this meet our budget? You know, is this what, is, is this increasing over last year's cash flow? And is this going to be comparable to our NOI growth for our peers? It, totally different outlooks. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that when they would look at deals in, at PEB, they weren't like even, you know, very finance, they weren't using like complicated financial analysis or anything. They were pretty quick to make decisions and like, hey, if this makes sense high level, then we know it's going to make sense if we dive in deeper. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. The, the, it's funny you use the word to make sense because if it made sense, we did it. And if it didn't, we didn't. Mm -hmm. it, it, they were, I would, I would take, I stole Phillips Edison's leasing analysis spreadsheet. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Ron Myers. <laughs> My old boss is there. Uh, and brought it to Peb. And they're like, this is a really cool match. And my boss at Peb, Ian Weiner and, and the team there, you know, they were like, Hey, look, this is a really cool metric and this makes a lot of sense. But then they'd be like, on certain deals. They'd be like, yeah, but do we really want to give a local operator this much TI? And I'm like, yeah, but look at the payback and the return. They're like, but it's a gross check of $75,000. Do we really want to put $75,000 of our equity into that deal? And I, you know, they, they, they did a great job of taking a big step back and just like thinking about it as like a fundamental business decision that does or does not make sense. Mm -hmm. And again, to repeat myself, if it made sense, we did it. And if it didn't, we didn't. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say that's how we operate here at Zig, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so what was that process like of like leaving and, and starting your own thing? You know, it's obviously very different, you know, starting to buy stuff for yourself. Was it you had saved up money and, you know, did a couple of deals with your own? Did you start raising money right away? What was that like? I would saved up enough money to not make a dollar for the first three years. That was critical. Mm -hmm. And 
lifestyle was going to need to change, obviously going from a great paying job with a lot of stability to uh, making the reckless decision of going out on my own. Mm -hmm. And and so that, that nest egg was critical and I didn't really have a pipeline or anything like that built up. I didn't think that was fair to my employer who was paying me well to give them everything that I had. And so I was comfortable with the idea of going out pretty naked as far as the pipeline goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so, yeah, the way you asked the question pretty much nails it. It was Mm -hmm. nest egg saved up and try not to run out of money before you invest it all. Mm -hmm. Gotcha here. And, you know, I'm, I'm by all means, not a real retail guy. I don't think John is either. When you talk about unanchored versus anchored, like what's the big difference when you're looking at deals? When the stuff, the stuff we buy will typically be in front of the Walmart as opposed to including the Walmart in the deal. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Or, uh, you know, we'll buy the take five oil change in front of the Publix anchored shopping center. Mm-hmm. Probably not buying the whole Publix. That said, there's, we're actually, there's some initiatives being had by uh, some peers of, I call them peers uh, as I grossly round up. Because uh, they're, they're buying, you know, major deals that are 30, 40, 50 million bucks. We've got some equity uh, groups out there who are, uh, for whatever reason, interested in what we do and, and think we do a pretty good job at it. That want a JV and apply our leasing background between myself and some of the other guys here, and and capital raising abilities to go out and buy what we would deem as bigger deals. But for them, it's like, hey, we don't have time to work on it, but we have the back office for it. So go find a 15 million dollar value add deal and you know no big deal and i'm like well that is a pretty big deal for us but yeah absolutely let's go find it mm-hmm. so but but in general now we're our core business and what we've built up so far has been basically uh call it twenty thousand feet and under mm-hmm. to, to and why stuff. why those types right why the why the unanchored in front of the publics and the walmarts and stuff great question so at first it was what we could afford mm-hmm. secondly it's a very sustainable business model. I didn't, I, 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 so I worked on a ton of box deals, backfilling large anchor spaces, specifically at PEV. And the market has shifted. Tenants are downsizing. The bench of tenants in the event that a grocer or a gym leaves, it's just shorter than it is at the 1200 square foot nail salon is. Mm-hmm. The other, the other factor that plays into that, there's, there's really a lot of reasons. The, the next reason is the, how do I say this in a relatively political correct way? The, the level of sophistication on the smaller deals is just less. We mm-hmm. have more opportunities to buy properties at a discount, which is the business that we're in because of somebody not even being in the business that owns it. I mean, if Billy Bob passes his property down to, his, uh, his grand, grandson, Billy Bob the Fifth, and Billy Bob the Fifth doesn't even know what Cam is, we're probably a really good buyer for Billy Bob because he didn't know what he's doing with the property and it's a good opportunity for us. If you're buying a $40 million shopping center with multiple boxes, the people who own it on the other end of the phone probably know what they're doing. They're, they're more inclined to know what they're doing. The, 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 the downside of that is, is the buyer pool is obviously substantially larger on the smaller deals, but in general, we'd like to think, or at least we've tricked ourselves into thinking here that we operate those properties and have the ability to execute on them pretty well, typically better than the average person who's playing in the game, in that game because, or in that sandbox, because we do this all day, every day, as opposed to being a doctor in California or uh, an inheritance of farmland in Mm -hmm. you know, South Dakota or something. No, it makes a lot of sense. It's, you know, similarly why, when I left Toro, I came down and, you know, I'm focused on, you know, sub $5 million buildings because, you know, out of state investors aren't buying apartments that are, you know, 20 units because they're tough to manage. So it's the same exact concept. So it makes total sense to me. Now, do you, where, because I, I agree with that, right? I, you know, it's funny, you said I joke about it all the time, right? You take a professionalism, you know, we started buying mobile home parks, you know, we're going to take the 200, 300 unit multifamily professionalism and go buy 50 unit mobile home parks. We're dealing with a different owner, right? Have you guys been too educated in the space where, you know, the deal's worth 2 million, but there are bidders in the 3 million range, just because oh. the market's been crazy. And 
where is the pipe? What's the pipeline look like? So, you know, I don't want to say run out of deals, but like, how do you know, even at your discounted offers, you're still going to be able to fill that pipeline up to do what you guys are setting out to do. Very, that's, that is, of all the challenges that we have in our business, that is the biggest, John. It's a conundrum for us. The what I take a, look, you guys heard my background, right? I bought a bar at 21, um, left a high paying job and started two companies at the same time at 20 or no, 29, 30, 29, I think. The point is, is that my risk tolerance is higher than others. Uh, I would say I, I would be deemed as aggressive on the, on the, on the scale. And for, but at the same time, I'm, we're very tight when it comes to the specific deal, like big idea, like let's go start a business. Let's buy as much crap as we can. Uh, another, uh, but, but when it gets into the nitty gritty of the deal, I take a, I take, I take an opposite approach to it. So where I'm going with that is, is it's been so challenging to find deals that I am kind of all in on expansion of the existing team. Uh, because we have to work that much harder to find for every deal that we find a and B if, and when, or I should say when a recession comes, which who the hell knows when that's actually going to come, uh, we're going to be more equipped and have a, a resourceful team in place that knows how to find and, cre- and structure deals. Cause they've been doing it in an environment where it's been very difficult. I mean, it's funny, like people are like, Oh, anybody who enters the real estate business, the commercial real estate business, uh, in 2007, or in this case, 2021, where things are on fire, has it easy? Well, not if you're in acquisitions of value add retail product or value add any product. Like it's very challenging to find deals right now. We have not bought a property this year. We're having closed on one. We have now. I say all that. We're going to have three in the next 30 days. But in general, we haven't mm-hmm. been up to snuff. And historically, we did five deals our first year, eight our second. The goal was to do 12. I still believe we can hit that. As crazy as that sounds, but as we sit here on May 11th, but it's been a challenge. It has been an absolute challenge. I'm finding that pricing is at higher than pre-pandemic levels, not even equal. Uh, and so we, so I, I'm, I'm going all in on expanding the team. We've got two people that we've hired here this year, Dan Sanfilippo on the acquisition side, and then Jake Dugan, who actually worked with me at PEB. Is, uh, is, is running point on both our leasing and finding deals uh, as he understands the, the platform very clearly and has invested with me multiple times as an LP prior to joining Zig. So uh, my thinking is, is like, if it's tough to find deals, just try harder. And the way that we try harder is increasing output and the way that I, can, I can't be on the phone with two people at the same time. So I'd rather have three of us on the phone at once. Mm-hmm. Are, when, you're, when you're saying on the phone, are you doing a lot of direct to owner outreach or? Are you yeah, so Dan, Dan and Jake do an outstanding job of that. I've, I've built, I say I built, we have built the business because I don't, I don't, even though I was the only one who was employed here, I still believe in we because we've got great partners and tenants and brokerage relationships. And I'm about to speak to the importance of those brokerage relationships. Like we built a pipeline prior, especially prior to Dan and Jake coming aboard through having outstanding relationships with both investment sales and leasing brokers that have brought us opportunities. Uh, we bought, it'll be two going on three deals on social media of the 14. So, uh, you know, not like, Hey, we're looking to buy properties, but through social media posts, we'll meet people and, and they'll bring us opportunities. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that who the hell knows who's listening to this. Maybe we'll send us <laughs> interesting value add retail deal. Uh, or, or somebody that I post about this on one day will, you know, bring you guys a deal for what you guys do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of direct to ownership calling. We've, we've invested in some software to find, obtain that information and, and try to unlock deals. We've had some success with that so far. And then additionally, like I mentioned before, it's, it's just having outstanding relationships with brokers. We kind of take a unique approach in the sense that we're not, we don't have on unlim- we don't have a limitless amount of capital like we, like we can't buy a hundred million dollar property but what we can do is move extraordinarily fast do what we say we're going to do and give brokers the opportunity to invest in deals and, and, and own the properties with us and so that's sort of our only uh saving grace to kind of get us to the front of the line of seeing good deals and, and thank goodness it's worked for us so, so far and we're going to continue to milk it as long as people will, can stand dealing with me and, and the team here mm-hmm. Awesome. So I, I'm curious though, as you do, you know, direct outreach stuff, are you more of like, it sounds like you might be an old school guy, pound the pavement, you know, 
call people, direct mail type thing? Or are you guys looking at any new ways of acquiring properties that, you know, maybe utilize some technology, data, things like that? Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty old school in the sense, I mean, we utilize the technology to get the information and streamline the process. But in general, I mean, we, you know, to me, like there's two types of marketing, what we do. Uh, there's casting the wide net, which is like posting on social media, going to now, you know, putting out there that we're going to conferences. You know, I host the podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky that I've been offered the opportunity to be on great ones like this one. Uh, and that, so I kind of look at that as like the macro. And then we also uh, take a more targeted approach of calling the owners directly. Cause I think in order to have any shot at doing what we're trying to do, we have to run a parallel path and do the wide range stuff and the, and the hyper-focused. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love it. And a question too, with uh, COVID and everything that happened, you know, being in the retail space with a lot of stuff that shut down, uh, how did you guys manage the whole process? Uh, were you able to get help? Did you need help? Were your tenants fine for the most part? What was it like? We had a hundred percent rent collection and we bought three properties and I wish we would have bought more. It wasn't the lack of trying. I, I, I'm very, I don't make a lot of predictions correctly. Like just don't, I'm not very good at guessing unless if I have a lot of good information. Uh, I figured when this thing shut down, it was time to get, when, the, when our economy shut down due to the, at the height of the pandemic, I knew it was time to hit the gas pedal. Should have hit, hit it even harder than I did, which thought I hit it pretty hard, but wish I would have done even more. And we bought three great properties in the height of it. And then successfully transacted on a few more later in the year when things were still pretty crazy. And uh, it was an opportunity as, as much as, like, let me go on the record and say, I never want anybody to get sick. Like, I, I don't care about making money enough or, or creating value enough to where it's at the expense of anyone's health. I, I say all that because of the economic repercussions of what happened with the pandemic, we were able to find and transact with some great properties. We brought an awesome deal down in Leesburg, Florida. We bought a deal that uh, we're, we're actually finishing up uh, a redevelopment plan on in Birmingham, Alabama market. And then we bought, uh, what am I missing? Oh, we bought an outstanding piece uh, up in the Orland Park market in Chicago. And that pricing did not exist pre-pandemic. It doesn't exist even today. Now that the world has sort of got a clearer understanding of where things are shaping up from a, a relief standpoint and whatnot. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, we made out of, we, 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 we did as well as we could have out of COVID and I wish we would have bought more than we did. Mm -hmm. I, if I saw them, I would have bought them. I really mm -hmm. would have. I was very bullish on that. I wasn't taking advantage of the opportunity at that time. I thought that the correction it still hasn't come yet. Uh, I would call it what we had last year a dip because it came right back to where we are now. I did not expect this. This is what's going on right now is insane. I'm not, I'm not, I'm sure what you guys are finding on the, the, the multi side is like, I, I can't even fathom to get hear about what you guys are having to deal with, but we're, it's, it's pretty insane for us too. It, it is not easy to procure good deals right now, which is why we're spending the additional resources to try harder and bring these people. Mm -hmm. is, is there a deal or a location like too small like you know is there something that you guys just can't look at because of its size or location yeah i mean look we we do a very good job of in general of staying in our lane we really like secondary markets we will do tertiary markets provided it's an a site in a tertiary market like i'd rather have the a site in the b market than the b site in the a market if like if we're going to go to, I don't know, if we're going to go to Leesburg, Florida, or Davenport, Iowa, or Benton, Arkansas, we want to be in front of Walmart or Target or grocery around a hard corner. Not saying visibility. Like, we're not taking compromised visibility in the market. Um, I, I personally, as one of the pillars of what not to do, which I think is just as important of knowing what to do in this business, I wasn't naive enough to think that, oh yeah, we can just helicopter into Manhattan or to the mission in San Francisco or onto Rodeo Drive and just go buy deals. Because if I'm seeing it, it's that good of an opportunity. Uh, that means every one of the developers that are constantly canvassing those markets on a day-to-day -day basis all passed on it. So 
that that said, in the secondary and tertiary markets, we really understand the retail patterns. And if somebody's like, oh yeah, I've got a Walmart strip, uh, shadow anchor strip, and some tertiary market in Tennessee. I have, I bet you I can get 75% of the tenants right up in that center without even looking at the site plan, just because of the patterns that we've seen historically in, in mm -hmm. the market. So, uh, I, not to belittle the importance of market intel because it's everything and it's how we make ourselves successful during the due diligence and post closing process of getting stuff leased up. But uh, figuring out a Davenport, Iowa is a little bit less daunting and more figure outable, if you will, than the Upper West Side and Manhattan. Mm -hmm. that's my thesis that's, that's how we've operated on it hasn't steered us wrong yet but I'm, you know jury's still out who knows if we'll if I'm, if I'm calling you guys asking for your job for your, for a job with you in six months I'm <laughs> no but it's a good point you make and you know we've spoken about it before but i don't think in a long time right when you're entering a market you know for the first time and you get a deal there's other people that have seen that deal before you because you haven't been there before right that deal has gone to the biggest player in that market that buys a deal all the time first and they passed on it for one reason or another. Now it could just be a very viable reason, right? Maybe they have, you know, they're tapped out or maybe, you know, they can't take on another property right now, or, you know, it's a little bit too small or a little bit too big, but guaranteed if you're just entering a market, whether to buy a deal for the first time, or you're just starting to gather Intel, the first deal or the first several or the first dozens of deals you see you're not going to be the first person to see that deal and other people have already passed on it. So I think it's a really important part. And it's not like, look, there, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like everybody's got to enter a market for the first time at some point, you know, you just got to understand that the first deal you buy in a market probably isn't going to be the best deal you buy in that market. And you've just got to, you know, have the wherewithal to stay with it, keep going and understand that, you know, it's a long-term plan. It's not just in and out. Yep. Fact checking your basis and making sure you're not in it too high on a pound per foot basis or on a, you know, on a cap rate perspective and knowing what, you know, in our business, it's really easy to understand where, especially the national tenants credit, national tenants credit typically trade. And so you can really get good gut checks. And then obviously having, uh, relying on and, and having relationships with local leasing people, which is something that we really hang our hat on here as far as their understanding of, Hey, look, you know, the tenant's paying 24 bucks. I don't know, man. If you lose them, they're probably, you're probably going to get 17. Or if they say, yeah, I could lease that at 40 bucks all day, well, that's going to materially influence our decision on whether or not we buy the property very quickly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Are you guys seeing any trends in retail, you know, just over the last couple of years or through COVID as things are changing? Like, is there a desire for, you know, different types of tenants, any different structures and leases, like anything changing? Yeah, yeah, but, you know, all retail's dead and the whole world's blowing up on fire and Amazon's going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. he didn't Sometimes I get frustrated and argue with people. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. There's more retailers opening stores than there's not. Like, look at the total numbers, whatever. And then the other side of me is like, you know what? Shut your mouth because that's presenting, that's going to get you discounted opportunities and let the narrative continue. As far as trends go, you, you, you've got in the 1031 exchange market, you've got large investor, you've got a large investor pool for any mix of or any single tenant use deal, um, single tenant net lease deal, uses that are pandemic, recession, and internet pool. So our urgent care business, for example, is very coveted by landlords, even though we only purchase. Uh, but because we fit all those boxes and haven't been are unlikely to leave as a medical operator because we invest a substantial amount of capital in the space, uh, people aren't gonna stop getting sick. You can't really buy a flu shot on the internet at least yet. You certainly can't buy a doctor's visit uh, that needs to look at your rash in person online just yet. I mean, there's certainly the incorporation of telemedicine, but anybody who's uh, truly ingrained in that space We'll, we'll tell you that it's not easy to pull off A and, and, and B, depending on where you are. It's difficult to make the economics work. Um, so med medical, we call it medtail, is sort of like the sexy thing right now where you've got urgent care operators like myself taking high impact retail spaces. Uh, services aren't going away. The, I will tell you the restaurant groups are 
certainly reevaluating their footprints and how things go. I mean, you know, I was just speaking to a 30 location burger restaurant chain down in Alabama and they uh, are going from 3000 square foot freestanding restaurants down to 1400 square foot buildings with a, a drive-through required. Uh, the drive-through was always there, but they want to shrink down because they didn't lose any sales as a result of the pandemic. And why pay the extra operating expenses and rent associated with all your space? Plus, finding staff right now is extremely difficult for them. So they, I, I give them a ton of credit for having the fortitude to shrink down the prototype. Uh, you, so you're seeing a lot of that. You're seeing, I, you know, the, the desire for end caps and drive throughs is at an all time high for everybody. Even, we're even exploring that with our urgent care business. It's crazy as that sounds because we actually converted a Kentucky Fried Chicken on our first location. We were doing a lot of COVID testing in the drive through. True story, it was nuts. Uh, so, premium uh, premium demand associated with NCAPs, drive throughs. Investors are looking for recession, internet, and pandemic proof tenants. Uh, 1031 exchange market is still insane, especially for essential businesses like that. Uh, you see it on all the broker blasts. And uh, the grocery stores are, are humming. They, they, a lot of them had epic years because people were staying home. And the there was a ton of expediting of closures of retail concepts that are not dynamic. And retail, I, I, I don't pretend to be a retail expert. I, I, I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about as it relates to retail commercial real estate, but being like a retail operator, I've had you know the bar business and the urgent care business. But in general, I look at things like you can't be in no man's land, meaning you have to offer up you know, Nordstrom, type service and, and therefore can charge Nordstrom right type pricing, or you've got to offer up uh, competitive pricing like Walmart. You, know, you take a brand like Steinmark, right? Steinmark uh, offered the same inventory that you can get online for at or greater pricing and did not offer up a competitive advantage to the consumer. And so COVID has expedited the process of retailers like Steinmark uh, that we're going to go BK anyway because the market was dictating that and it just expedited that process. It's probably healthy and it just cut to the chase uh, as, as much as I hate saying that. And that's, that's, sort, of the, that's sort of my uh, unsolicited uh, retail synopsis of what's mm -hmm. going on in, in that space. No, I think it's okay. Go ahead. I was about to say, I think it, it's an interesting space. You know, a friend of ours, Ryan Daigle, had a post on LinkedIn talking about, you know, what's not institutionalized, like what's the next asset class. I said retail, not retail is institutionalized, but there is an appetite, I think, for what you're doing that that is very attractive. Those smaller, I don't want to say off the beaten path because I know that's not what it is, but but that there's something about that that in today's world is attractive and would be intriguing for the right people. So I think, you know, everything you said is something that we, you know, we've said on multifamily stuff when we first started, you know, when we were, everyone was buying in, you know, the best market in Charlotte, North Carolina, I was buying in Mobile, Alabama. Now Mobile, Alabama is, is you know, can't touch that either. So I love what you're doing. And, and in a, in a space where people think retail, all retail is dead, it's, it's, it's worthless. I disagree. I think it's a really interesting place to be as long as you have the right location, the right you know, square footage and you can deliver to the right tenants, I, I think you're, you're going to be golden and, and you probably have a higher yield than you do in, you know, a 250 class A apartment complex, right? There's nothing there. So I, I love it. I love what you've said. I think it's important. And, and honestly, you know, we haven't had many retail people to talk to on our podcast. So it's been enlightening to hear that that's out there because it's something that I've been intrigued with over the last, you know, six to eight months. Well, you could have done a little bit better on your retail guess, but um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully had a little bit of eye up. No, it's good. So talk to me a little bit about the the franchisee stuff. How did you, like, how did you get into that? How does, like, how does that even work? And like, what's the, what's the goal for you guys? Yeah, sure. How does it work? Uh, we fly by the seat of our pants. No, uh, my best friend and roommate from college is my business partner. Again, his name is Aaron as well, which is really confusing and also a great opportunity to make cheesy jokes at us being Aaron. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a vision of going into business together for quite some time, especially in a brick and mortar format. His background is working in his family's business, uh, 
upfitting uh, retail stores actually, ironically. So they sell everything to the retailer that uh, other than the actual inventory itself. So checkout counters, the bags that say thank you on them, uh, casing, slat wall, hangers, everything in between. And so he had, he has an, between his experience and his personality, uh, a phenomenal uh, skill set of being able to hire and fire anybody from the hourly truck driver all the way up to the general manager and has done all those things and is not afraid to roll up his sleeves. He's a culture first guy, and does a great job of finding the right people and putting them in the right places and you know, knows the back end stuff like payroll and, and, and wants to roll up his sleeves on the operations side. So between his skill sets and my perceived skill sets of understanding the important fundamentals of retail real estate and how to structure deals on the real estate and just operation co-side financing, we felt like what he did well, I could help out with him. What I don't do well, he does extraordinarily well. So we felt like it was an opportunity for one plus one to equal three. And at that point, we both knew that we weren't smart enough to come up with a business idea. <laughs> <laughs> like this is he's we're both doers we're not like uh super creative uh you know people that are going to come up with you know we're not elon musk over here uh and don't pretend to be so we knew we wanted to franchise something and that, and i knew that there was a feel for that product type uh on um, in the net lease market and so we really wanted to franchise something um and and it turned out that we ended up looking at hundreds of different brands and concepts you know food is a little bit challenging for us we're not like he's not neither one of us have a restaurant background uh and and the ones that you know we were looking into that weren't already built out we're going to appear to be a little bit difficult to scale fitness you know he wasn't in love with it i you know i i would have done it but we didn't like you know there was there was always a concept he would like but i didn't love as much and vice versa and then so after looking at several hundred things we actually had planned a trip to go to New York for this franchise trade show and came across the franchise sales rep for American Family Fair. And we both looked at each other like the light bulb went off, snap of the finger, and you knew it was for us pretty quickly. Got introduced to the brand in like June and had a franchise agreement signed in October of 2018. And we got the one location open with, the, with another one underway and under construction. And we're off and running. We're, we're excited. We're going to do as many as we can because uh, our mission is to help as many people as safely as, they, as we can, as fast as we can, and uh, as quickly as we can. So, awesome. Cool. Yeah. So uh, is your partner, Aaron, running the day-to-day -day on those? Do you guys like hire a manager overseeing them? How does that whole process work? Both. He runs, he runs the business day-to-day uh, -day on the operations side, and we have uh, fantastic management. In the clinics we just um, our team's awesome they've they've done a phenomenal job of realizing how little uh value i add by making sure that they're the ones doing the work and mm -hmm. uh, and making things happen they're they're our team's on the that awesome that's very cool um Awesome. I think that's a, a really great place to wrap up. So Aaron, thank you so much for coming on and just sharing your, your knowledge, your insights, experience and stuff. If people want to follow you, learn more about you, get in touch with you. Where can they do all that stuff? LinkedIn. My name's Aaron Zucker again, and I'm the guy who looks like he's 18. On the profile picture. Uh, our website, uh, ZuckerIG.com, Z-U-C-K-E-R. I G as an in investment group.com. And then I'm, I'm on Instagram too, Aaron.Zucker. I'd love to talk to whoever I'm on Clubhouse as well. I think the same same handle name, Aaron.Zucker. So awesome. reach out, especially if you have a good retail deal, because as you heard, if you're at this point of the show for whatever reason, then you uh, and aren't tired of listening to me talk yet. I'd love to I'd love to buy something from whoever's out there listening. And, uh, I, I can't commend you guys enough for the platform that you guys have put together. It's really impressive and certainly can't thank you enough for having me. Awesome. No, thank you. Uh, guys, definitely go check them out, hit them up, follow them, uh, connect with them. Thank you everybody so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you're not already subscribed, it would mean the world to John and I, if you would do so. And if you are, please send it to someone that would get a tremendous amount of value from this episode. Aaron, once again, thank you so much for coming on, man. This is great. Yeah, leave these guys a good review. They're doing a great job. Appreciate your time. Love Thanks. it.